What do terrorism, opioids, fake news, infectious disease have in common? They all involve people that are embedded in social networks. We are inherently social creatures. It's wired into our biology, and I think we're dangerously unaware of what that means. So, when most people think of social networks, they think of Facebook or Twitter. How many likes did my last post get? What's the coolest hashtag? But social networks have been around a lot longer than social media, uh, all the way back to fourth grade in the 1930s. This is one of the earliest social networks published in an academic journal, and it's a fourth grade class. And the triangles on the left are boys, and the circles on the right are girls, and the lines represent friendships that they reported. And if you look just closely enough, you'll see that there is a boy that likes a girl, and she doesn't like him back. <laughs> social networks are simply a collection of people, a set of people, and relationships between them. Those relationships might be friendship, email, sexual contact, or kinship. Pretty much anything. My interest in social network analysis began when I was teaching uh, at West Point, the US Military Academy. And I had some students at the time that were downloading videos of uh, roadside bombs in Iraq or Afghanistan. And so I suggested to them that they uh, use social network analysis to connect the videos and uh, identify clusters that might show similarities between them. So we can look at features, we can use those to relate the videos, and when you find a cluster in the network, they might have some similar feature. For example, in one cluster we looked at, there was a blue truck in every single video. And we began to realize that that truck would stop in traffic, wait for a break in traffic the other way, and as traffic resumed, then it would gun its engine, signaling the sniper to shoot a soldier, and then the traffic would mask the egress uh, from the sniper team. So in one of the videos, we were able to find a license plate, send that to people forward in Iraq, and they were able to use that to track down the terrorist cell. And as the Army operationalized this, it was credited with an 85% reduction in sniper activity in Iraq, and they could not estimate the impact it had on improvised explosive devices. And so the Army sent me to get a PhD, and then I ended up going to uh, Afghanistan and Iraq. And so as I started adding forensic clues to the networks, uh, I ended up getting to the situation where I would travel around Iraq and Afghanistan, teaching soldiers how to do graph theory and linear algebra so that they could do better targeting of terrorist networks. Now, I learned something very interesting in that process. I learned that there is a difference between formal networks and informal networks. So let me explain. A formal network is essentially a hierarchy. This is a military company, and these are sergeants in that company. So the first sergeant, the senior guy, is at the top, as you might imagine. And then there's a, two platoons on the left and center. And on the right is the headquarters section. And this is a, a hierarchy, right, a chain of command. And those formal leadership structures are important for efficiency. They minimize costs. They minimize waste. They standardize things. They keep people on task. Those are all good things. But if you ask those sergeants who they relied on to get their job done, a different network emerges. And in this network, the most junior sergeant is kind of at the top. Now, in this particular organization, that sergeant, when he, uh, when he came as a, as a soldier, he uh, had a college degree, and, and they needed somebody to fill the position, and so they put him in this position. He'd been there for about two or three years, and so he'd gotten a chance to know people across the post. So if you needed to get ammunition to qualify your soldier on a weapon, if you needed to get training area to practice battle drills, if you needed to get some kind of resource, that's the guy that had it. And I think we've all been in organizations where, yes, there's your boss, there's that formal chain of command, but there's somebody in your organization that knows how to get things done. They know how to fill out the form. They know where that resource is. They know who has that critical skill that you need. That is informal leadership. And that's what drives innovation in organization, is those informal leaders. They broker knowledge and resources across the organization. You see, in uh, Iraq and Afghanistan, in the early days, we were uh, identifying who was the cell leader, and we would capture them, and then who's the next cell leader, and we'd capture them. But when we could identify the informal leaders, innovation broke down across terrorist networks. 
So I uh, think to understand informal leadership, we need to go back to social psychology. And in particular, the uh, conformity experiments of Solomon Ash in the 50s, he uh, basically took three lines, you see A, B, or C, and a reference line, and he'd ask people a very simple question. Is that line the same length as A, B, or C? Simple question. But you see, the trick is that only one of the subjects was really a subject. The others were confederates of the experiment and agreed to report a wrong answer on a certain subset of the trials. And he wanted to see if the subject would conform to group pressure. And he found that about 37% of the time, people would conform to those critical trials. His, uh, Stan, uh, Ash's student, Stan Milgram, uh, did a similar extension of that where he said, do people conform to authority figures? And you might have seen the popular movie, The Experimenter, uh, that was uh, covering that. So as I'm teaching this in a social psychology class, one of my students, Nick, goes, that's the coolest thing I've ever seen. I'm going to do that on my platoon tomorrow. And I'm like, Nick, you can't just go do that on your platoon tomorrow. And he's like, yeah, I'm a platoon sergeant in the United States Army. That's happening tomorrow. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like Nick, there's ethics and research. There's IRBs. You can't just do that on your platoon. And, and he replied, well, I'm in charge tomorrow. <laughs> so I said, all right, let's make it good. So uh, <laughs> the previous semester, he had a uh, social network uh, of his platoon. And so we were able to identify central actors in green and peripheral actors in red and say, hey, is there a difference in the level of conformity between people that are central in a social network and on the edge? And then the black dots uh, basically represented people that were the confederates of the experiment. Now, it's a little weird to show people lengths of lines, right? People would know something's up. But in the military, as people are looking to get promoted, they have to go to a promotion board where they're asked essentially trivia questions or military knowledge questions. And so we took some of those questions that people study for and we made a multiple choice. And so this was my favorite question. Now, if you're not laughing, that means you're either not reading the question or you don't know what a tourniquet is, because that's funny, right? When would you tourniquet somebody's neck, right? Well, you wouldn't, right? But surprisingly, people that were peripheral in the network would conform to a wrong answer on questions just like that. And people that are central are looking around like, what's wrong with you people? And so I repeated this study after I got ethics approval and IRBs and all that sort of stuff. And we repeated this across uh, a number of platoons. And we found that we could explain about 85% of conformity based on your position in the social network. We are inherently social. Uh, I also study social neuroscience. And so I've done about a half a dozen studies of uh, neuroscience across the Middle East uh, in Jordan. And we find that when we have people collaborate on tasks, similarity in neural activity can indicate uh, better uh, opportunities to compromise and even friendship formation. Uh, we actually find that when people are at rest between cognitive tasks in neuroscience experiments, the areas of the brain that are active, just as you're at rest, are the same areas of your brain that are active when we ask you to think of social relationships. What does that person think of me? Right? When you're identifying with characters in a story, we're inherently social. It's wired into our brain. I'm currently using neuroscience with uh, my colleague Megan Moran here at Johns Hopkins for tobacco cessation. Another colleague at Sui Yang, we're doing HIV prevention, uh, using social neuroscience to understand the effectiveness of public health campaigns here in Baltimore. Public health practitioners have been using networks for quite some time. And uh, when, you, when you can map out a network of a potential group that's experiencing an epidemic or a, or a health concern, you can identify opinion leaders, just like we I did in the, in the previous example with the military company, to see who is that informal leader that can promote the health campaigns and promote the positive health practices you want to adopt. We can also uh, identify clusters. Uh, and those clusters can help us treat groups. So another colleague of mine here, John, uh, Sean uh, Falad Noelia in uh, the Johns Hopkins Medical School, is doing a hepatitis C intervention here in Baltimore. Now, if you have hepatitis C and she treats you, and then you go and inject drugs with somebody with hepatitis C, you get reinfected. So we have to understand that cluster in the network and treat them all at once if we're going to prevent the epidemic. Now, there's other applications of networks. So in the Ebola outbreak in Liberia in 2014 to 2015, we found that network interventions to affect cultural practices that had negative health outcomes 
were more effective than any kind of clinical intervention. We even know that obesity is socially contagious. So when an overweight person spends time with other overweight people, their social norms of what acceptable diet is and what acceptable body image is changes and obesity becomes socially contagious. Uh, th there are many applications for this and uh, I would tell you that over half of deaths in America are the result of lifestyle choices that are preventable, preventable, such as drug use, smoking, diet. And we do not align our resources for research and problem solving with that fact. This problem is made even more complicated with the internet. So another couple of my colleagues, Jackie Jennings and Ben Meza here, have found that in Baltimore, when they look at new HIV cases reported, almost two-thirds of victims report meeting their sexual partners in online, not physical venues. So we took all the venues that are reported and we created a social network. So the, the dots represent venues, the lines represent relationships uh, where people reported meeting sexual partners at both venues. The orange dots represent online venues, the green dots represent physical venues. And those dots are sized by the number of people that reported meeting a sexual partner in that venue. So you'll see that large dot in the upper right, that's a very popular social media platform in the US. Uh, but it's largely contained. We can probably work with that platform to address the public health epidemic resulting from social media. But if you look at the lower left, we see an ecosystem that's mixed between online and physical venues. And we need to innovate new challenges or new solutions to those problems, but the network matters. And we can't very well go to online dating apps and tell them to tell people to practice safe sex and advertise the fact that you might be meeting somebody with HIV or an STD online. Doesn't really work well for their business. So what does, what do uh, opioids, terrorism, infectious disease have in common? They all involve people that are embedded in social networks. And as I've shown, we are inherently social creatures. It's wired into the biology of our brains. We need each other. We need those social relations. But I think we're dangerously unaware of what that really means. When you think of the people that you spend time with, how do they influence you? Do they affect your taste in music? Your taste in politics? When we're trying to address social problems, what solutions do we look for? Are we looking for network interventions that can affect culture that results in negative health outcomes, or do we just focus on clinical interventions? When we try to improve organizations and create innovation, do we only focus on the formal leaders, or do we focus on informal leaders and, and think about how we can promote them? Social networks matter. Most people think they're just dots and lines, but really, it's about all of us. Thank you for your time.